Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Association of the United States Army's annual conference and trade show in Washington, D.C., the number one gathering of U.S. Army leaders from all around the world to talk about the service's future, its strategy, budgets, technology, and more. Our coverage here is sponsored by Bell, a Textron company, Elbit Systems of America, L3 Technologies, Leonardo DRS, and Safran. And we're here on the Bell stand to talk to Mitch Snyder, the president and CEO of uh, Bell. Mitch, great seeing you. It's uh, excellent seeing you as well, and uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's an absolute uh, pleasure. We had a great conversation at Farnborough, uh, and I just want to follow up. Uh, a lot of action at this uh, AUSA. Uh, Army leadership making the message and the importance of uh, modernization. Uh, obviously, the joint future or, or, or the future vertical lift uh, is one of the priorities. Uh, I know General Rugen has been spending a lot of time talking to all of you guys about that. He's the capability, uh, the cross-functional team lead for, for that. Talk to us first about, you know, give us an update on how the Valor program is doing. Um, the 280 uh, has been moving through uh, um, the flight development process, and you guys have been going faster and faster with the airplane. So bring us up to speed on what you guys are up to. Yeah, I think uh, Don Grove, our uh, test pilot, you know, was a CV-22 uh, test pilot, said it best. He said uh, the V-280 is a sports car. You know, the, the V-22 is a fantastic truck, but the V-280 is a sports car. Very maneuverable, very fast efficient, quite different uh, from flying the V-22. So I think the, pro the program is progressing well. You know, we have over 65 hours of flight on the aircraft, 155 hours of rotor turn time. We've had it at 1.9 Gs. Uh, we've had it flying at 50% torque at 200 knots. At 250 knots, we've had it out to a flying at 80% uh, RPM. So it's progressing well. We plan on flying it at the 280 knots before the end of the year. and. Uh, and then next year we plan on doing some autonomy work with it where it flies by itself. Um, and uh, uh, tell us a little bit, you know, you guys have, um, are, are, are trying to work the speed equation but also work the cost equation on it, right? So it's a two-part question. First, how closely is the flight testing mat matching the modeling, right? Because you do the flight testing to match the modeling. So how closely is this airplane performing to the way you expected it to perform? So in terms of uh, performance modeling of the aircraft flight, we'll start there. It's doing extremely well, and one thing I also want to mention is the agility in the action. That's one thing that the uh, the Army always wanted to know and say, hey, tilt rotors we know up and away, they're very fast and efficient, but can it perform in the X? And I think we've shown with its pirouetting and, and doing what it can down the runway, spinning, and uh, how fast it decels and excels. Uh, so we're showing that agility. And then as far as the cost affordability goes, you know, we modeled what we thought the thing would cost, and we targeted in the 30 to 35 million dollar range. You know, as as the target cost, and as we have worked through the trade studies, as we we time study the uh, the aircraft build, what our supply chain is showing, and you run the curves and analysis, and we're landing pretty close in that range of what we said it would cost. And then, as far as the maintainability, reliability, uh, that has went beyond our wildest dreams. You know, when we designed this new nacelle and said, "Hey, it's got to be easy to get in and maintain." and it's got to be reliable and it's showing everything is throughout the, the 65 flight hours so far it's doing exactly what we thought it would do um are the um and thank you very much for bringing that second piece of the uh the question in there because i was going to go in one direction and i said wait a minute let me do that and, and full disclosure bell also sponsors uh the defense and aerospace uh report podcast uh so everybody should listen the washington roundtables every friday the business roundtables uh every every monday on uh about world markets um you know one of the questions that has always existed is the mental, changing the mental model of, of, of the Army. The customers used to flying helicopters. Uh, once upon a time, there was a very strong cadre of Army officers who wanted the V-22, but that never really materialized. How is that education process going to put Army aviators in this who have a tendency of thinking that any, that a helicopter should replace a helicopter, whereas you're trying to show them, hey, look, a tilt rotor could change how you guys do business, right? Nobody has to convince the Marine Corps of that, mm -hmm. but how's that Army education process going? Well, I think hearing it from the Army leadership themselves this week has uh, been fantastic. So when they've come in now before, they've even said, you know, a year ago at the show, you know, everybody says, let's let's see, they've flown the simulator, yeah, it flies, the simulator flies well. Uh, but after this year of flying and seeing it in action, uh, we've had comments from very senior Army leaders that, you know, hey, it's flying like you said it would fly, and it is very agile. And so now they're starting to talk about, yeah, this could be that aircraft, which we fully believe as well. 
Um, is there any message in the first capability set, though, is a 40 by 46 foot landing area? There are those who interpret that as a very clear message that the Army wants a helicopter for its next scout. Is that a correct interpretation of that requirement as, as somehow limiting or excluding you guys? I don't think so. I think what they're saying is that's the requirement. You know, when they say that's 40 by 40, we're going to look at different technologies. As I've said, when I took away the helicopter name, you know, we invent flight and flight experiences. Doesn't mean we don't do helicopters as well. So, you know, you look at the, the innovations that we've got going on. We've got the requirements now for that Cape Set 1, and we're working on the design, and we actually have a really cool concept that I think is going to meet all the requirements, if not exceed them. And uh, we look forward to uh, the Army seeing that later this year when we submit the proposal. Um, and for anybody who doesn't know Bell's history, right? I mean, the Aero Comet was uh, the first jet, was a Bell jet, and the first supersonic aircraft was uh, the Bell X-1, was, was uh, a Larry Bell uh, product as well. Um, let's talk about the 247, right? I mean, it was extraordinary to see it in model form, but it was really great to see it in modern-day Marine, the um, unmanned, multi-purpose, uh, tilt rotor that folds up to the size of a UH-1, uh, a little bit, a little bit close. Right. You know, UH-1's got a little slimmer of a tail, right? But you're, the footprint is roughly the same, and you can squeeze it into a garage of a DDG-51 as well. Um, any Army interest in that platform, if you look at it, it can do so many different missions. Talk to us a little bit about perhaps the Army opportunity you see there, even though you guys are sort of targeted for a Marine requirement. So I think we are, you know, again, the MUX requirement was the, uh, the program we were going after initially when we designed the 247. But as you said, if you start looking at next-gen UAS requirements for the Army, uh, we fit in the top end of that as well if you look towards a Group 5, a, a larger UAS capability. And we believe, like you said, we've designed it to be very flexible and modular in its nature so that it could be multi-mission. In fact, even the Marines wanted to do six to seven different types of missions. So we believe that it could do those missions as well as the Army missions. And the most important thing about that, though, we like to say, is we did the V-280. We went from a clean sheet to a flying aircraft, and it's flying fantastic in a very short period of time. So when you look at that mock-up, if you remember, we did this mock-up, you know, three or four years ago and said, hey, we're going to build that aircraft and have it fly. So now you're looking at the mock-up of the 247, and we're saying, hey, lowest risk, we know how to build it, and we're going to make it fly in four to five years, as, as we've said for the Marine Corps. But we do believe there's an Army uh, requirement that we could fit out there. Well, but you can also look at this as an Air Force requirement or even a Navy requirement, right? Yeah, it's multi-purpose, right? So it really comes down to what service is looking for what kind of unmanned capability. But if you want something that, uh, you know, can take off vertically from anywhere and then fly, you know, 350 nautical miles, stay on station for 8 to 10 hours, all kinds of payload, lift. So, yeah, it could go to any service. And even, uh, even a rescue mission, right? I mean, you could put pods on the side of it and pick people up. We have actually talk to the United States Air Force about that for some sort of uh, long-range personnel recovery in high-threat environments. We could have side pods on the 247, fly it in, land it, have somebody climb in and get them out of there. Um, amazing. Let me ask you about um, the cross-functional teams. Futures Command is the way of the future. Uh, obviously, I think the Army leadership has made clear about that. Whatever debate was, it's over, uh, as the leadership has said, and we're moving out with it. And you can see the advantage of having very experienced operators build the requirement and then be paired with acquisition folks who can help deliver it. We had a great conversation with uh, General Gallagher, who's the cross-functional team uh, lead on networks, and then uh, Dave Bassett, who's executing that at PEO uh, C3T. From the standpoint of a CEO, though, is there the kind of clarity uh, you need in terms of how to interface with the customer, who's doing what? Some folks have said that they could, they would like a little bit more clarity, and even Secretary Esper told us, you know, look, we're, we're working our way through the problems, but as somebody who, who our Army is one of its most important customers, how are, is, is there that clarity of, out of the new structure that you'd like? I think the Army's doing the right thing in making it more clear. I think you see where they've you know, started off with saying, hey, we are going to modernize our forces. I think it was great this week when they said, we wanted modernization done by 2028, or in the works, right? That we want to have a new modern army by that timeline. They've laid out their priorities, the six priorities. They've stood up a futures command. They've got the CFTs functioning. We're starting to interact quite frequently now with those. And I think what we've continued to say is, what you see behind us is the poster child for tremendous success for Army modernization. It had a five-year head start. It's flying extremely well. Let's lay out the requirements in an accelerated acquisition process, and you will for sure have this on the ramp in 2028. 
Um, are you satisfied with the schedule they're operating at? I mean, you know, there was a concern in the vertical lift in the industry. Uh, did you see how I said vertical lift industry <laughs> instead of helicopter? Uh, 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 that that it wouldn't be moving fast enough. That these programs were too far in the future. Are you satisfied with the the schedule and pace of everything that you're seeing coming out of the service? So I think yes, where it's at now, right? Because the Army have have said this week, we want to modernize by 2028. So. You haven't heard the 2030s anymore. You're, they're saying we need something in 2028 within 10 years. So now they're what you mentioned earlier, the CFTs, they're working on how do we accelerate these schedules? How do we get the budgets in place? And how do we make this come to fruition by 2028? So the new schedules are starting to work with us on. And like I said, when you see what we've done, clean sheet to flying in by 2017, the amount of flights we have on the aircraft, this could quickly transition into a program that they could have that on the ramp by 2028. So I think the schedules are getting there. Uh, let me ask you one last question. The White House uh, last week issued its uh, national um, industrial health report card. Uh, the president started that process in mid-2017. Pentagon gave its feedback in earlier uh, this year in, in April, and now the final reports come out to identify sort of uh, points of failure in the, in the def national, um, uh, national national security uh, industrial uh, infrastructure. Um, you've got uh, tens of thousands of suppliers around the world uh, for your commercial and for your military products. How are you, what, what does this report mean for you and the steward, stewardship and the investment you're going to have to make in some of your suppliers to safeguard them and, and address some of the administration's concerns? So as you mentioned, it was a concern and that was refreshing to have that come out so we could take a look at it. You know, when we went through sequestration and the Budget Control Act and when everything got clamped down, you know, we were starting to worry about the industrial base and and it's not so much the OEMs. I mean, we, we are finding our way through it in some of the first tier, but when you start getting to the lower tier supply base, you know, there are some small businesses out there that are really starting to hurt when you see the quantities of buy come down or the sustainment wasn't being bought, where were they going to go? I think what you can see right now, now that the report's been submitted, you're going to see that the worry is true out there and we've got to work on it, but I think at the same time we're real excited because like what's going on here and the excitement here at the show is the Army wants to modernize, which means all brand new equipment coming out and not just recapitalizing existing equipment, but brand new equipment. So there's a chance for new development out there, a lot of money flowing that way, so I think the supply base is excited as well. Mitch Steiner, President and CEO of Bell, a Textron company, sir. Thanks very much. Always a pleasure. Best of luck on the program and uh, best of luck at uh, the rest of AUSA. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you, Vago.